The Senate will be in order. Would senators Madam, please take their conversations to the cloak? Madam President, we've set a very unfortunate precedent here. This means that the Senate can ignore, in effect, the House's impeachment. It doesn't make any difference whether our friends on the other side thought he should have been impeached or not. He was. And by doing what we just did, we have, in effect, ignored the directions of the House, which were to have a trial. We had no evidence, no procedure. This is a day that's not a proud day in the history of the Senate. If you want to find her, that would be Madam President. Uh, Senator from Utah is recognized. Madam President, I ask unanimous consent to enter into a colloquy with my Republican colleagues. Without objection, so ordered. Madam President. <clears throat> Senator from Utah would hold. We do not have order in the Senate. I would ask all senators who are, to take their conversations to the cloakroom as well as the staff. The Senator would just hold till we have order, please. Senator from Utah is recognized. Thank you, Madam President. What we've witnessed today is truly historic. This has never occurred. Nothing like this has ever occurred. You know, under Article 1, Section 3, Clause 6, we've been given a duty. We've been given this, the sole exclusive power to try all impeachments. Try all impeachments. Not some of them, not just those with which we have happened to agree, not just those that we are happy that the House of Representatives undertook to prosecute, but all. The word try is also significant. It refers to the word trial. It's the same word. It's a proceeding in which the law and the facts are presented to finders of fact in front of judges in order to reach an ultimate disposition. In a criminal proceeding, it would be a, an ultimate disposition culminating in a verdict of guilty or not guilty. We were precluded from doing that job today, and we were precluded from doing so in a way that is not only ahistoric and unprecedented, but also counter-constitutional. Nothing could be further from the plain structure, text, and history of the Constitution than that. So let's look at the arguments that we would have heard, that we could have heard, that we should have heard today, had things unfolded as they were supposed to. Had things unfolded in a manner consistent with the oath that we took, first when we were sworn in as United States Senators, we're all required to take the same oath to the Constitution when we did that, but also the oath that we took just a few hours ago in this very chamber, in this very case, to decide this case impartially. What would we have heard? Well, first and foremost, regardless of what you think about what a trial consists of or how different people might cleverly define the term, a trial will always, at a minimum, involve lawyers. Involve lawyers, and unless the person is proceeding pro se, you will always have lawyers there. Or at least one side will always be represented by lawyers, and in 99.9% .9 of all cases, both sides will. You will hear from lawyers. We didn't hear that today. We didn't hear from the committee of individuals appointed by the House of Representatives to be the, the House impeachment managers or prosecutors. What else would you expect to hear? Well, you'd, you'd hear uh, evidence. Evidence would be brought in. Sometimes trials in the Senate involve bringing in evidence uh, in a documentary form. Other times you might have witnesses. We didn't have any witnesses. We didn't have any documentary evidence other than that which was charged. So let's talk about what was charged and what evidence we could have, would have, and should have heard had we done our job today. Well, the, the accusations in this impeachment trial can be fit into two categories. Category one is found in Article one of the Articles of Impeachment. Article one alleges that Secretary Mayorkas repeatedly, defiantly, did the exact opposite of what federal law requires. Namely, that under myriad circumstances, eight or nine different statutory provisions that he violated, he was required to detain people whom he did not detain. But it's not just that he didn't do what the law required, he did the exact opposite of that. Instead of holding them until such time as 
they could be removed or alternatively adjudicated to have the status, whether under uh, impeach, uh, w whether in the context of immigration parole or asylum or otherwise. He just released them. And in many cases, gave them work permits. We would have heard evidence about the fact that memoranda issued by Secretary Mayorkas within the Department of Homeland Security didn't just tolerate this result, they instructed this result. We would have heard evidence about the fact that at the outset of the Biden administration, Secretary Mayorkas, when asked what he would tell those traveling through the caravans, those paying many thousands of dollars per head, in some cases tens of thousands of dollars per head, to international drug cartels, instead of telling them don't do it, he said, maybe don't do it yet. Give us a few weeks before we're ready to receive you. Showing intention, a forethought, to facilitate the violation of federal law. We would have heard evidence about how he instructed his own department to violate those rules. We would have heard evidence about how directly contrary to federal law those things are and contrary to his own oath and his own duties. Now, as to Article I, the Senate chose to dispose of this today by doing something it's never done in any context anywhere close to this, with a point of order that said as follows. The majority leader stood up, defiantly refusing to have the Senate perform its obligations and raise the following point of order. He said, I raise a point of order that impeachment Article 1 does not allege conduct that rises to the level of a high crime or misdemeanor as required under Article 2, Section 4 of the United States Constitution is therefore unconstitutional. All right, let's, uh, let's talk about that for a minute. Now, had, had we been permitted to have a trial, alternatively, had we been permitted to go into executive session, alternatively, had we been permitted to go into closed session, as several of us moved today, we would have been able to hear arguments about this, about how wrong this is. Because that's what you do when you have a trial. You hear evidence, you hear arguments from lawyers, and when someone makes a legal argument, as Majority Leader Schumer just did, you can consider their implications, and most importantly, consider whether or not the argument is right. Because when we're sworn in, in a trial of impeachment, our job is to serve as both finders of fact and adjudicators of law relevant to this case. We were denied that opportunity. So uh, while we're exploring what we would have heard had we gone to trial, had we done our job, let's also explore what would have happened in a real trial had somebody made an actual motion and we've been permitted to do our job. Well, look, first and foremost, this is uh, uh, patently absurd to argue that a willful refusal to obey the law that one has a sworn solemn obligation to perform is somehow not impeachable. We don't have to look too far in order to find support for the conclusion that this is an illegitimate, unwarranted, uh, unwarranted unsubstantiated claim, one that's directly contrary to law. In fact, we don't have to look further than President Biden's own lawyer, the Solicitor General of the United States, who holds a, a special position within our federal government, performs functions that many people mistakenly uh, associate with the Attorney General. But it is, in fact, the Solicitor General who is the United States government's chief appellate advocate and chief advocate before all proceedings in the U.S. Supreme Court. There was an exchange in a case uh, argued last term in the Supreme Court of the United States called United States versus Texas. In that case, the Supreme Court uh, heard arguments from the state of Texas about whether or not this administration's approach toward these same provisions of law is acceptable, whether or not they could challenge them. Now, unfortunately, the Supreme Court uh, reached a, a conclusion, a conclusion with which I strongly disagree, and the Supreme Court concluded ultimately that the state of Texas lacks standing to challenge uh, uh, federal policy, federal policy along the lines of what we're discussing today, uh, uh, notwithstanding the fact that it's, it's conduct that inflicts substantial harm on the state of Texas and its residents. But the important part 
that we should have been able to argue here today is the exchange that occurred at oral argument between Justice Kavanaugh and Elizabeth Preliger, Solicitor General of the United States. In her capacity as Solicitor General, as the Biden administration's chief appellate advocate and chief advocate before the United States Supreme Court. Justice Kavanaugh asked her a number of questions at oral argument, and on page 50 of that argument transcript, some of that discussion ensues. He asks the following, if a new administration comes in and says, we're not going to enforce environmental laws, we're not going to enforce labor laws. Your position, I believe, is that no state and no individual and no business would have standing to challenge a decision to, as a blanket matter, not just enforce, uh, just not enforce those laws, correct? Is, here's what Solicitor General Prelegor says. Quote, that's correct under this court's precedent. But the framers intended political checks in that circumstance. You know, if, if an administration did something that extreme and said, we're just not going to enforce the law, at all, then the president would be held to account by the voters, and Congress has tools at its disposal as well. So this argument continues, continues on to the next page, in which Justice Kavanaugh says, what are the exact tools that Congress has to make sure that the laws are enforced? And, and Solicitor General Prelegar Answer. She says, well, I think Congress obviously has the power of the purse, and she goes on to explain how this is relevant, and then this goes on until we get to page 53, and then at page 53, Justice Kavanaugh jumps back in and says, I, I think your position is, instead of judicial review, Congress has to resort to shutting down the government or impeachment or dramatic steps of some sort or another. Solicitor General Prelegar responds by saying, well, I think that if those dramatic steps would be warranted, it would be in the face of dramatic abdication of statutory responsibility by the executive. So she just acknowledged exactly what has happened here, and she acknowledged that is exactly the moment at which the impeachment power becomes very relevant. Lest there be any doubt on that, this stuff was settled not just in 1789, when we adopted the Constitution, and when the framers used the language that they did. But remember, the framers were not operating in a vacuum. They were not writing on a blank slate. They were incorporating legal terminology that had been in use for centuries. In fact, Justice Story, in his, his treatise on the Constitution, discusses this very kind of thing and explains in section 798 of his, uh, his famed treatise, written not so very long after the Constitution itself was written, that we got this stuff from England, that the, the British knew what impeachment meant, and they understood what would constitute a high crime or misdemeanor. In section 798, Justice Story acknowledges that there was precedent, there was an understanding at the time of the founding, that recognized that you would have an impeachable offense if, among other things, a Lord Admiral will, would have neglected the safeguard of the sea. They didn't have a Homeland Security Secretary then, not in America, not in Britain. But this is really analogous. This is the exact same thing. Somebody who had a duty to do a certain thing under the law defiantly refused to do so. Those are arguments we could have and would have and should have heard today had we had an actual trial, had we been permitted even to go into executive session or even to go into closed session. Why closed session? We don't want to have to do it in closed session. But you see, the standing rules of impeachment in this body preclude us from having this very kind of debate. So when Majority Leader Schumer made this argument to the great shock and surprise of all of us, we wanted to warn the body and have this debate. He wouldn't let us do that. The Democrats voted us down. So that's, that's, uh, that's, that's Article 1 in a nutshell. Article 2 of the Articles of Impeachment, what do those get to? Well, those are interesting because those deal with false statements, knowingly false statements repeatedly made by Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas to Congress. To Congress, as it's performing its oversight responsibilities, he lied to Congress according to the allegations of the Articles of Impeachment in Article 2. To my great shock, I didn't, look, he, he was dead wrong as to Article 1. But if he was dead wrong as to Article 1, he was deader than a doornail, whatever that means. 
10 times more dead as a doornail as to Article 2 than he was to Article 1. Why is that? Well, because they allege in Article 2 that Secretary Mayorkas knowingly made false statements. Knowingly making false statements is a, is a felony offense. It's punishable as a crime, as a felony federal offense under, among other things, 18 U.S.C. Section 1001. It's really routinely charged, prosecuted, and is the basis for lots of convictions for a felony offense. You can go to prison for a very long period of time for that. Now, for Chuck Schumer to argue... Senator Yale, Yes. I just want to be able to be sure I understand, Senator. I thought I heard... Mike, microphone. My Adam, uh, I asked uh, Senator Lee if he would yield to a question. Uh, I thought I heard Senator Schumer argue today that lying to the United States Congress was not a high crime or misdemeanor and therefore could not be the basis for uh, an article of impeachment. It, 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 did I hear that correct? Correctly? That is exactly what he said. That is exactly what he said when he made this motion, because he stood up and he said, I raise a, a point of order that impeachment Article 2 does not allege conduct that rises to the level of a high crime or misdemeanor. So, even though lying to the United States Congress is a felony, under the precedent that the majority leader and our Democratic colleagues established, it's not a high crime or misdemeanor? Is that what we did? That is precisely what the precedent established today stands for. That is, we've effectively, by this vote that the Democrats forced through, not even allowing us to debate this, and this is why I raised a point of order, on, or this is why I, I made a motion, that we go into closed session to discuss this, because we've now set a precedent that effectively, very arguably effectively, immunizes from impeachment, making a false statement to Congress. Can I, may I ask one more, uh, yes. Senator? Yes, please. Well, I'm trying to follow the, the Senate Majority Leader's logic. What do you have to do to get impeached now? I mean, a felony is not sufficient. What's above a felony? Well, let's see. Obviously, uh, uh, spreading what they deem misinformation uh, on the Internet might be a felony. Uh, I, I, I suppose at some point... But, uh, but, it, but, it, but it takes, as I understand it, Senator, you're a legal scholar, it takes more than a felony now. A high crime or misdemeanor. Yeah, I mean... It takes more Who's than a high crime on first? What's on second? I, I don't understand any of this, and I'm very, very worried and would like your thoughts or, or others' thoughts about the precedent that our Democratic colleagues, in their haste to sweep this under the rug, may have established. Yep. Will the gentleman from um, Louisiana yield for an adjunct question With to pleasure. his question? With pleasure. So the law says that lying to Congress is a felony, since we're no longer using impeachment as a means to address someone who's lying to Congress, how does Congress prosecute or address someone who deliberately lies to Congress now that the Senate has swept away through this presidential action today the opportunity to use impeachment for that purpose. Thank you. Yeah, and I'd love to respond to that point briefly, if I could. The, what we've done is to effectively immunize this uh, against impeachability. Immunize making false statements. And, and going back to the original question, I don't know, maybe aggravated first degree murder with uh, heinous, atrocious, and cruel conduct as aggravators, maybe that's still a high crime or misdemeanor. That, that, that remains to be seen. But keep in mind, particularly with the, the, the fact that they already set aside Article 1 and they've already said that that's out of bounds as well for impeachability, the Supreme Court has said pretty much nobody has standing to address that. What are we left with? 
And uh, getting, getting back to the, uh, to the question from Senator Lummis, this is a phenomenally dangerous precedent to have set here, specifically with regard to the false statements. Because what does that do to our oversight hearings, where we, we rely routinely on testimony provided under oath by cabinet secretaries and other administration officials? What does that do? What incentive structure does that create? What perverse incentives does that create for them to lie? Uh, with the Senator Yield? Yes. Uh, are you aware, here's a question, are you aware of the fact that President Clinton was impeached? And one of the charges against him was lying under oath in a civil lawsuit. Are you aware of that? Yes. Okay, so you can be impeached for lying under oath in a civil lawsuit but apparently you can't be impeached for lying to Congress about how you do your job. So here's what I, I'll give Senator Schumer the benefit of the doubt, Senator Kennedy. He's saying that the fact pattern here apparently doesn't rise to the level of high crime or misdemeanor, that, that we don't have a situation, it's a policy disagreement. We've taken a policy disagreement in the House and tried to turn it into impeachment. Well, here's a question for you, uh, Senator Lee. Are you aware of the fact that two days ago, two days ago, uh, Secretary Mayorkas was asked about the parole of the man alleged to kill, to have killed Lake and Riley, Mr. Ibera. Why was he paroled and how, how he was paroled? Under the parole statute, 212D5, there's two ways parole can be granted. Unique humanitarian need circumstance. Your mother's dying. Something's going on bad. You need to get into the country on a temporary basis or special benefit to the United States. That means you're a witness in a probably cartel trial. <clears throat> Those are the only two reasons you can be paroled. And two days ago, no yesterday, Secretary Marcus said he did not know why Mr. Barrow was paroled. Which one of the two was it? This was a question from Congressman Bishop. He said, I didn't know. At the same time he said, I didn't know, I had the file, and it says, subject was paroled due to detention capacity at the Central Processing Center in El Paso, Texas. In the file, he was paroled because they didn't have any space for him. Senator Schumer, this is illegal. The Secretary of Homeland Security cannot just add a condition to a statute. The statute doesn't allow you to give parole because you're full. And the reason this man was given parole is not because of the statutory requirements, because we'd run out of space, because we got more illegal immigrants than we can handle, and the rest is history. He gets paroled, he goes to New York, he gets convicted of a crime, he goes to Georgia and he's accused of murdering this lady. Seems to me that would be something we should argue over as to whether or not you should lose your job. Because you've got a statutory requirement limiting your authority to parole people and in your own file, Exhibit A, you paroled him because the place was full. This happened two days ago. So... This gives kangaroo courts a bad name. This is a friggin' joke. We have a nation under siege. 1.9 million people have been paroled. Are you telling me they do an individual analysis on all the people? In February 2023, no, November 2023, I asked him, Secretary Marcus, do you do a case-by-case -case analysis? Senator, we comply with the law. So you're telling me, of all the 240,000, the ones in front of us, you determine they meet the criteria of urgent humanitarian need or significant public benefit? And he said yes. This was in November, under oath to me, when I questioned, I don't believe you. I don't believe you're doing an individual analysis on this stuff. You're doing blanket parole and you're paper whipping this stuff. It turns out, he gave false testimony to the Congress. Whether he lied or he just doesn't know what he's doing, I don't know. 
You should be impeached either way. If you don't know what you're doing, you should be kicked out because you don't know what you're doing. But the man that we're talking about is the one charged with murdering this young lady who has gone on a jog. If that's not important to the American people to find out how that happened and should somebody be held responsible, what the hell is? You can talk about why we impeached Trump and Clinton. Was it worthwhile? Did it matter? Was it all political? You cannot say this is not important. To say that how we're doing, he's doing his job, is not important to the American people. Tell that to the Riley family. This is not an academic debate. The policies of this administration being carried out by Secretary Mayorkas are illegal. The man charged with killing Lake and Riley was illegally released into this country by DHS. That should be something we argue about in the Senate as to whether or not you keep your job. It's been swept under the rug. There will be an election in November. This is the only chance you have to get this right to the American people. We had a chance today to hold somebody accountable, finally, for all the rape and the murder and the drugs. The largest loss of life in America is fentanyl coming through the border for young people. How many more people have to be died, die, rape, or murdered before somebody is held accountable? We had a chance here, and our Democratic friends swept it under the rug because they're more concerned about the November election than protecting the American people. And this is a sad day for the Senate. Law train kangaroos you everywhere what are I said. going That's to be question. offended. Uh, by the use of the term kangaroo court. In fact, the entire marsupial world will be offended by this. <laughs> Senator Marshall, you have a question. Yield. Yes. It certainly seems to me that today, 51 of our friends across the aisle voted to not have a trial. Make note of this, that every person voted in that trial was a vote for an open border. It was a vote to tell Lake and Riley's family that the life of their daughter didn't matter. It was a vote to tell the 250,000 families that lost a loved one to fentanyl, it doesn't matter. But what struck me as the clock struck midnight here and we lost that vote, I feel like the Senate was gutted, that we lost part of our powers. You know, in high school, we were taught, high school government, we were talked about checks and balances. And one of the checks and balances that that the legislative branch had on the, on the executive branch was this impeachment process. And I want to ask my, my colleague from Texas, why do I feel like I've just been gutted right now, like the entire Senate, that this body has been gutted of, of a power that, that we're never going to get back, that, that impeachment going forward may, may mean nothing. Am I wrong? I'm sorry to say that my friend from Kansas is not wrong. In the 237 years of our nation's history, I don't know that there has been a more shameful day in the United States Senate than today. What we just witnessed was a travesty. It was a travesty to the United States Constitution, and it was a travesty to the American people. And it's important to understand why the Democrats did what they did. We're here on the Senate floor right now, but I want the record to reflect. I'm going to do a very accurate count of the number of Democrats who are with, with us. That would be zero, other than the presiding officer, and somebody has to preside. Not a single Democrat senator chose to come to this floor and listen to one word of evidence. When it comes to the Constitution, the Democrats concluded that Joe Biden and Alejandro Mayorkas defying federal law, ignoring the text of the statute, deliberately releasing criminal illegal aliens over and over and over again, that's just hunky-dory. You can't impeach him for that. Every Democrat just voted. By the way, every cabinet member, guess what? You've just been given a blank slate. Ignore the law. When Democrats are in charge of the Senate, the entire cabinet could ignore the law. It is no longer impeachable. 
in Democrat wonderland when a member of the executive branch openly defies the law. By the way, every Democrat just voted that way. They didn't hear one word of argument. The majority leader didn't stand up and say, here's the reason why it's okay. No, he didn't present that argument. They didn't read a brief. Nobody wrote a brief. They didn't care enough to know what Senator Lee just laid out, that the Biden Department of Justice went in front of the U.S. Supreme Court and said if the executive defies the law, the answer is impeachment. The willingness of every Democrat to be blatantly hypocritical. Just last year, the Biden Justice Department said, no, 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 you can't sue in court. When we, the Biden administration, defy the law, the answer is impeachment. And like three-card money, every Senate Democrat said, no, 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 the answer is not impeachment. I don't know what it is. Actually, I do know what it is. There's only one answer left, which is everyone who is unhappy about the open border shows up in November and to use the phrase, throw the bums out. Because if you're not willing to do your job, is there not one senator on that side of the aisle who cares enough to honor the Constitution? By the way, the second article they threw out said lying to Congress is not a high crime or misdemeanor. It's not impeachable. Now, as the senator from South Carolina pointed out, Bill Clinton was impeached for lying under oath. And you know what happened? That he was ultimately acquitted. But after a full trial where they heard the evidence, where the Senate did its job, by the way, one of the impeachment managers was Senator Graham, who presented that evidence right here on this floor. And you know what? Before Bill Clinton, there's a guy named Walter Nixon. You may not know who Walter Nixon is. Walter Nixon was a federal judge who was convicted of perjury. He was from Mississippi. He was convicted of perjury in front of a grand jury, and he was impeached. And it went to the Senate, and the Senate convicted him and removed him from the bench. So you want to know what the precedents were prior to today? You commit a crime, lying under oath, perjury, it is a high crime or misdemeanor that is impeachable. No more. Because understand the Democrats' rule here. This is all about, this is not about the Constitution. None of them care. By the way, we repeatedly moved. Let's go into debate. Hear the other side of the argument. No. Nope. Look, the famous three monkeys, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. That's just evil, what they did. They don't want to know because they don't care. Because it's not about the Constitution. It's not about the law. It is about political expediency. But every bit as violent as what they did to the Constitution was, it's even more offensive what they did to the American people. Last year, 853 migrants died crossing illegally into this country. That's almost three a day. You go down to the southern border, you go down to Texas, with the Democrats don't bother to do because they don't care about the people dying. And you see photograph after photograph that Texas farmers and ranchers are finding of dead bodies on their property. Many of my colleagues here have been down there with me, have seen the elderly people the human traffickers have abandoned have seen the pregnant women the human traffickers have abandoned have seen the infants and toddlers left to die. The Senate Democrats just told the American people they don't give a damn about the bodies and the people who have died the last three and a half years and they don't give a damn about the people that are going to die next week. Next week, more migrants are going to die. When we brought 19 senators down, to the border, we went out on a boat in the Rio Grande, we saw a man floating dead in the water. Senator Lee was there, Senator Kennedy was there, he had died that day. The Democrats just told the American people they don't care. When you go down to the border and you look at the children who've been brutalized, just about all of us here are parents. I will tell you, when you look in the eyes of a little girl or a little boy who has been abused by traffickers. And you see it, you see the pain, you see the agony of children trapped in sex trafficking. The Democrats just said they don't care. They won't hear the evidence, they don't care that it's deliberate, and they don't care that it'll happen next week. 
that it'll happen tomorrow. Tomorrow there will be children brutalized because of the Democrats' open border policies and not a one of them cares. They don't care about the women who are repeatedly sexually assaulted. Again, when you look in the eyes of these women coming over, it's heartbreaking. And the Democrats just said, we don't care. And they don't care about the more than 100,000 Americans that died last year from drug overdoses. The highest in our nation's history. 70% of that is from Chinese fentanyl coming across our southern border. And the Democrats said, we don't want to hear about it. We're not interested in the Americans dying. You know what they also don't care about? They don't care about the criminals that are being released day after day after day. The Biden administration is releasing murderers and rapists and child molesters, and every week we see another story of somebody being killed, somebody being raped, another child being assaulted by illegal immigrants released by Alejandro Mayorkas and Joe Biden. How shocking is it that there wasn't one Democrat who says, you know, massive human suffering matters. We ought to hear the evidence. How shocking is it that there wasn't one Democrat? One! There are 51 of them on that side. Not a single one could screw up the courage to say, let's do our job, let's hear the evidence. How shocking is it that not a Democrat cares about the, temp about the terrorists who are streaming across our southern border? The nation of Iran has called for jihad against America. Hamas has called for jihad against America. Hezbollah has called for jihad against America. And Joe Biden and the Democrats have put out a red carpet and said, if you want to murder Americans, come across our southern border, and we the Democrats will welcome you. Like many of us on this floor, I was in Washington, D.C. on September 11th, 2001. I remember the horror. I lost a good friend. Barbara Olson, who was in the plane that crashed into the Pentagon, I remember the smell of smoke and sulfur and burning. I remember the agony, and I remember the national uni unity that came after 9-11. As Democrats and Republicans came together, I don't know that I've ever been more proud of a president than when President George W. Bush stood on a pile of rubble with a bullhorn talking to firefighters and New Yorkers, and one of, the, one of the men in the crowd called out and said, we can't hear you, and he responded, well, I can hear you, and soon the whole world is going to hear you as well. We were as one. Today, not a single Democrat was able to mount up the courage to tell the majority leader, you know what, I don't want another 9-11 to happen. The House impeached Alejandro Mayorkas for, among other things, releasing terrorist after terrorist after terrorist. We ought to hear the evidence. I believe today we have a greater risk of a major terrorist attack on U.S. soil than at any point since September 11th. And every Democrat just told the American people it doesn't matter to them to hear the evidence. I appreciate my Republican colleagues who are here, who are willing to hear the evidence, willing to engage, willing to stand up and defend the American people. But you know what? The Democrats who aren't here, they aren't here because you know who's also not here? If you look up at the gallery, the reporters are all gone. A couple of folks in the back, I hope you're all right. But the reporters are absent. That's the Democrats' plan. What is fascinating, we're presenting arguments. Many of us, particularly those of us in judiciary, but many of us have presented those arguments over and over and over again in hearings. Not a Democrat argues on the other side. It's an issue unlike any other issue I know of in politics. Listen, if we're arguing about taxes, as Republicans, we say we should cut taxes. It's good for the American people. And you know what Democrats do? They stand up. We know they're talking points. No, no, no. Tax the rich. Okay, fine. We have a debate. We're talking about just about every issue 
The Democrats will argue on the other side. They have their spin. What is fascinating? Where's Dick Durbin, chairman of the Judiciary Committee, standing up saying, no, no, it's not right that migrants are dying every day. No, it's not right that children are being assaulted every day. No, it's not right that women are being sexually assaulted every day. No, it's not right that they're releasing terrorists every day. They're not there. Not a Democrat is there. Why? Because you cannot defend it. I'll tell you, South Texas for 100 plus years has been a Democrat region of our state. It is turning re red with the speed of a freight locomotive because nobody can see the suffering that is unfolding and defend it. And the Democrats, by their silence and by the complicity of the press corps, they are counting on the press corps to write story. Victory for the Democrats! Yay! They got rid of the impeachment trial. That's the headline they want. Understand they don't have a substantive defense. None of them disputes a word we are saying. Not a single Democrat has stood up and said, you know, it's wrong that Lake and Riley would still be alive if Joe Biden hadn't let her murderer go. They know it's right. The reason they didn't want a trial is they don't want the American people to hear about it. And it's our obligation to make sure the American people do. Senator Ricketts, is the former governor of Nebraska, I'd love to get your perspective on this. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate the colleague from Utah organizing this. My, my, my. 